Welcome, welcome back to the Agostino Zinger Show, episode number 169, with me, your host, Agostino. How you doing? How you feeling? Oh, I feel good. I feel bad. I feel awesome. I feel amazing. I feel strong. I feel ready to go. Um, You won't know this because, you know, I'm recording this right now, but I just recorded an intro that was like five, ten minutes long, probably my best shit I recorded ever, and I realized that the fucking thing wasn't recording. But you'll have no idea about this, right? I could say this to you, and you could think, yeah, right, I guess, you know, you didn't really do that. Um, And I can say it to you, and you can believe me, but it doesn't really matter now, does it? Because you're never gonna hear it. Anyway, <laughs> um, welcome back to the show. Hope you guys are doing well. I've flipping missed you lot. Um... It's not been a while, really. Um, I haven't. I've kind of missed a couple of days of uploading on Monday and Tuesday because you know life got in the way, and I didn't really have the time in the morning to kind of get it done. I don't really like saying that kind of sentence because you always have time, but I like to do this stuff on my own um, in the house when I'm alone and shit. So that you know, there's only a certain window you can do it in. So when that window's gone, it kind of have to scrap it to the next day. C'est la vie, c'est la vie. Um, it might mean that I might have to then go and get a studio, which I don't really want to do, but you know, because it's just an, an it's just an extra expense. Um, I guess when this podcast starts to make any sort of income, any sort of money, that might be the first thing that I do, put that money straight into getting a studio. But for now, um, I feel good. I feel amazing. I just came back from a run, a good little workout I had today. Um, I'm following the CrossFit Endurance work plan. I did um, four 400 uh, meter repeats around a little block around where I live in um, Stratford. And I was walking home today. I had a bit of an epiphany, right? And this epiphany was consi- was in, um, um, I was thinking about grip. And I was just thinking about like how hard it is to kind of do something in life, right? To kind of like, you know, chase your dreams, to try and hustle, to try and, um, you know, whatever. Just, you know, have your fingers in different sort of pies. How hard it is to balance different projects and shit, spilling the old plates, right? And I was also wondering because I've had this constant idea in my head or constant thing I've been ruminating or thinking about over the years about the notion of grit, right? And whether or not grit is something that is intrinsic or something that can be cultivated over time. And, you know, some people argue for and against, whatever it may be. But I think the older I've got, especially I think most of us can can attest to this. I think the older I've got, and I look around my friendship group, people that I know, and people that are on paper more successful than I am, on paper who are on harder times than I am, or, you know, harder times, or, you know, going through some difficulties in life. The one thing that kind of separates the kind of successful and non-successful in traditional terms for me anyway, is hard work, right? There are some people in the group that are supremely talented, people who have been kind of savants from like the, uh, you know, the beginning stages of when they f- I first got introduced to them or I first came across them or first started talking to them. And there are some people who have also lucked out and had the luck of the draw and just, you know, been able to work in great positions over, over the period of time. And there's also some people out there who have also had, you know, great social networks that have allowed them to kind of amplify their voices. But I've, apart from that, when you've really, really, you know, um, dilute it down and really kind of get to the nitty gritty of it, you realize that hard work is one of the things that kind of separates, you know, the good and the great, or, you know, not good and the great, the people that kind of achieve their dreams, the ones that don't achieve their dreams. But what the older you get, you also realize that everyday life gets in the way, right? You might have a partner, you might um, have a kid that's unplanned, you might um, get fired from a job, you might, whatever it may be happen, right, that will come in your way, that will then stop your plans, right, bring up a little hurdle. And sometimes the nobler thing to do, the, the honorable thing to do is sometimes to maybe, you know, uh, pack up your bags and just leave, right? And just kind of, you know, say, look, I've had my time, I've had my run, it's not going to work out, let me just let me just go ahead and, you know, and live this normal, regular, regular life. Some people can say that's a defeat, but I think for some people, that's a very honorable thing, right? Because I think... The other part of success as well is delusion, right? That's a part of success that normally speaks about, but it's something that is in- incredibly, incredibly important. You have to have a sense of delusion um, uh, or a sprinkling or a tablespoon, right, of delusion or a drink a fucking bowl of tea of it, right, in order to sustain the challenges of life. Because for you to, for you to have in your head that somehow it's going to work out, that somehow if you stick to this plan that you want to do, whether it's taking pictures, drawing, writing, working for an agency, wherever it may be, right? Wherever that that thing you want to do, if you stick to this plan, that no, if I stick to this plan, it's going to work out. That is quite delusional, right? Thinking that it's going to work out because you've got no evidence that it has because, you know, the previous four or five times you've done it, it's flipping failed. But those are, that's the thing that you need to succeed, right? So delusion, hard work, uh, grit. And then, of course, endurance. I've heard a lot of people mention this a few times, especially within our little scene in streetwear. Endurance is something that's really crucial because, especially in niche scenes or in smaller little subcultures, 
Um, if you're like the, imagine you were the photographer kid um, in 2005 when Hypebeast got founded, right? You were the kid that went around to all the little senior events, all the art galleries, store openings, um, capsule launches, and you took pictures. You know, just took pictures and uploaded them onto, onto the internet. If you just hung, hung around and just kept doing that for 15 years or 15 years plus, right? Up until now, up until, 19, up until 2019, there's no, there's no, um, there's no, uh, there's no thinking where you'd be. Really, think about it. Just pure endurance. You might be, you might have your own company. You might have your own photography studio. You might be working in house of a brand. You might be a contractor working underneath various other brands. But there is a possibility that if you just hung around and stuck it, stuck in it, right? Just put your flag in the ground and said, "No, I'm the photographer guy." You'd be where you want to be. But again, I think I've realized, especially with me, with this podcast and stuff, like you know, I get up at six a.m. I go do a workout for an hour. I come in, I run back, I wash, I shower, I quickly have breakfast in the morning, which is super early at seven o'clock or seven, half seven in the morning. Then I have to record this podcast, upload it before I leave, do all the, do the flipping, um, the cover art for it on YouTube, make the cover art for it on iTunes and Spreaker and Google Play and Spotify and all that malarkey, add the notes, add the titles, upload, then go to work. Right, so I'm having to do all this in a really tight window, and I'm doing it again and again and again and again. It's only for my own interest. I'm not doing it for, um, you know, for a heady goal or whatever it may be. I'm just doing it because I enjoy to do this sort of stuff. Right, I listen to podcasts every single day. I probably listen to podcasts more than I listen to music, even though I'm a flipping DJ, which is weird as it is. But hey ho, it is what it is. Um, it's something I enjoy to do, but I know thinking about it and looking at it from just a critical point of view, I think, you know, walking back home from the, my my run today, I was like looking from a bird's eye point of view. It's like, what the fuck are you doing, right? I'm out in the morning, at 6 a.m. in the morning, doing laps around this block, panting and breathing, trying to keep a steady heartbeat, uh, trying to keep a steady pace in order to kind of get my fitness up in order for a run I'm going to do later. And I'm running back to the podcast that I'm going to upload on YouTube. It's just flipping bizarre, right? And then you're going to work for eight hours. It's just like nutty stuff. But then I get it. If, if the grit, if grit and, if grit and um, hard work is something a lot of people don't have, I understand why though. Because sometimes, you know, the immediate results that you're seeing on paper don't necessarily correlate to the efforts that you're putting in, which again is what it is. But I think sometimes in life, I think I'd much rather go to my deathbed knowing that I tried to do something I enjoyed. I tried to make my dreams happen rather than just, you know, um, uh, giving up and kind of um, surrendering to the man. I don't think that's necessarily something I want to do. And to, and to be honest, I'm not, even, I'm not even in a bad position. I can't really complain. My regular, regular nine to five job is pretty decent, right? It allows a lot of flexibility. I can come in, um, I can come in at, I can come in kind of when I want. I can leave kind of when I want. I can work at home. I can work outside the office. Um, it's there's a lot of flexibility that allows me to kind of you know do things on the side. I'm not in a rigid kind of nine to six, nine to five sort of like um schedule. But still, I I, I could I couldn't imagine a life where I just give this all up and just live the normal regular life. I couldn't imagine it. I think I was just li- realizing it on the way home. And I think that might be grit. That might be what grit is. And I guess it's something that I've just always had because I know for sure it's not something that I've got from my parents because my parents aren't necessarily the most grittiest people in the world, right? They send, they do tend to put like, you know, hang up their, hang up their hat whenever it gets a bit too tough, which is understandable, right? Because they've had a lot of hardships in their life before they even came to the, um, came to the UK. But I think for me, um, in my kind of privileged self, right? With the opportunities I have in front of me, I think, you know, life can't really be that bad. Um, I can try and achieve my dreams and the worst that can happen is I have to move back in with my parents. That's not that big of a deal, right? It's not, there's no, um, there's no uh, apocalypse now situation that's going to really fuck me over if I chase what I want to do. So I think that kind of is what gives me a little bit of confidence. Anyway, um, outside of that, I've been pretty cool. I've had a, a pretty steady weekend. I DJed on fr- on Friday at um, the, um, the Free Compasses, which was a fucking awesome night. And I DJed again on Saturday at Heathcote and Star for my night lab at Tease and Bump. It's two stellar, stellar occasions. Um, I took a little bit of the advice I listened to on the podcast from Resident Advisor Exchange, right? They had a Resident Advisor Exchange recently with... Um, let me see if I can find the episode. Actually, um, I took some advice on there, and it kind of it kind of worked. I think it kind of helped. It kind of got me get me. It got me thinking about what I want to do. So there was a resident advisor exchange recently with um, the hour, right? I think I mentioned it previously. Um, the hour, uh, DJ etiquette, chill out rooms, and singly, right? I got I got it up on the other screen if you can see it there, right? Yeah, boom, boom, boom. So I listened to this podcast, and it mentioned something really interesting. I think towards the end of the podcast, one of the DJs, the female DJs, mentioned something along the lines of like, oh, if you don't want to be booked as a warm-up DJ, don't play as a warm-up DJ, right? So the, the thinking is like, I've I've got into this, this kind of rut at the moment where because I play so many long sets, 
um, sets that are, you know, more than two hours. I'm always warming up, quote unquote, and I'm always the, you know, the closing deeds, whatever it may be. But because you're so, I'm so used to warming up, I'm always used to starting really slow, right? Starting under 90 BPM and then kind of slowly getting the party started, right? And the idea is that when I'm in those bars and, and clubs, whatever they mean, or bars and pubs, people don't really want to hear banging beats, right? Um, at 7 a.m., 7 p.m., 7, um, 7 p.m., 8 p.m., and 9 p.m. They want to just be slowly drawn into the night. So, I try and kind of, you know, slowly cultivate that that sound. But then sometimes when you get a little bump up in kind of opportunity in terms of the place I'm playing now in Dawson, which is a little bit more of a, you know, hipstery area, people might want a bit of a dance in those kind of environments. It might be beneficial to ramp up the kind of the tunes, the tunage that you're going to be playing. And just because of the clientele there, it probably is beneficial to show off exactly, you know, the kind of way you are musically inclined. So it's been a bit of a it's been a bit of a challenge to kind of start my sets a little bit quicker than I would have in the past. But in an effort to not, you know, be fought as just a warm up guy, I decided to do that and start, you know, DJing a little bit more quicker in the beginning, especially when I DJ in Dawson. And the last couple of times I've done it, it has worked out a treat. Um so much so that I think a couple of I think a couple of parties ago, maybe a couple of months ago, I DJ that Dawson started quite quickly and played some good stuff. And a lady that was in the bar kind of hit me up and said, "Hey, she like what I play." And she wanted to kind of get me to play at her exhibition. And you know, you get this a lot when you're a DJ. You get a lot of people coming up to you and saying, "Oh, I'm gonna have a wedding. I'm gonna have a disc. I want you to play my thing." They're, they're, you know, people are just drunk. People are high. They feel they they feel like um they feel like one with the tunes that you're playing and they're in that moment where, you know, they want to, they want to fucking get you involved in things. And sometimes it never really transpires, but this time it did, right? It did kind of transpire. She hit me up a couple of weeks later. Um, we kind of went back and forth and now I'm going to be DJing at this girl's art gallery exhibition, um, on Friday. I wish I could tell you the details, but I can't, I've been embargoed. Um, it's been made, been made, been made very, very clear that, um, this, um, gallery occasion is oversubscribed and there's going to be a lot of people there and I can't bring any more people. It's just like a, funny funny thing in that regard anyway in, in general but um that was just a good thing right in general like put 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 aside um the kind of you know the attitude um which i'm have done a problem with i guess i think if you if you rate yourself that highly i think it's all well and good but it's just been a while since i've been exposed to that kind of level of um um i wouldn't say hips or whatever that person is right i've not really been around it in a while because i've you know the time i've kind of stepped away from dawson but i think it's a good little um validation for myself as a dj right that strangers are coming up to me and asking me to play at their parties or at their things that they're doing. I think it's something I'm really, really appreciate. It's something I'm really grateful for. And again, it's just a validation that I'm able to appeal to, you know, the general consumer. And I think for me, that was something that was very really important when I started DJing because I know for sure, like I mentioned a few times, it might be egotistical to say, but I know I'm as good as most of these scene DJs are out and about now playing most of the big you know clubs and circuits around london i know i can go toe to toe with these guys back to back any day of the week right but sometimes i think the real talent of a dj is the ability to kind of merge the boiler room crowd and somebody that would go to weather spoons right to make that those two people dance in one space is something that i'm kind of really trying to get to the bottom of now again it's difficult it's hard it's not something you can always do but i think the fact that i can go to a weather spoon, imagine a bar like weather spoons and fucking tear that place to, to pieces left and right from the beginning to end makes it so easy for me then to go to like a a set of fucking oval oval space wherever it may be and absolutely smash to pieces that's something i could i know i could do with my eyes closed but again i think it's the training of having to go through the fire and having to play in a pub where people are requesting songs from you in the first five minutes that you get there they're constantly pestering you about this pestering you about that about that it's something that's really gave me a steely steely fucking determination to really succeed and you know so far so good man and again, like I said, it's just that grit, right? I don't think a lot of people have, like, the ability to play in front of, I don't know, 16 punters in a pub who don't give a fuck that you're there, right? Um, the ability to play in front of no one and don't give a fuck. The ability to, I don't know, travel to a random place somewhere and play for 50 quid, right? It doesn't Not everyone can do this sort of thing, and I'm happy that I can at the moment. Um, anyway, um, moving on in, moving on up. Let's get into some news and topics so we can talk about the stuff that I've seen on the interwebs lately. Number one, Yes Jules v. The World. Oh, my God. So, our girl, Yes Jules, um, I'll say our girl because I made a video about her a few months ago, I think, when the whole Zero Seven Shake thing situation was going down, right, and everyone was fucking hating her in that regard. But it seems like she's back in the news again. Again, she's back in the news. Um, And this time around, it's to do with... Why is it not playing? 
this time around, oh there it goes um and this time around she's kind of responding to her haters right because it seems like um a few was it a few months ago a few months ago there was a lot of rumblings lots of conversations talking about her and how she's basically acted in a scene and people coming out and kind of slating her whether it was a joe budden whether it was a karen civil whether it was a scotty beam it seemed like everyone was trying to was throwing kind of darts at her way and she kind of spent you know she stayed relatively quiet after the whole um niggas wet niggas lie a lot kind of t-shirt con, um control controversy and a lot of stuff i just forgot what the actual issue was before oh there must so something else happened in between that but I'm not sure exactly what it is but but that's neither here or there, right? Um, but she's saying she's feeling she's staying fairly quiet. You saw her hanging around with um, he, um, um, Kanye a lot. They went to Africa. They, I think people were upset that she went to Africa. And they were handing out white Yeezys that she mentioned before in the video. But it seemed like she kind of made it a, a, her mission not to be, you know, too controversial, say something too wild or crazy. But, you know, I think that she was getting thrown too many darts and too many subbies <laughs> too many shots were coming her way and she just basically had enough and decided to go on um it looks like um, murder mook and his other friend um i don't know who the other white guy is but a podcast called easily offended and they sat down and basically she talked about the issues i'd be having for more than three hours now don't get me wrong i think the majority of the conversation is a bit pointless i think some of the stuff they've been speaking about is like you're gonna you could probably skip over it probably three hours of my life that i wish i got back but it's good to hear her kind of stand up for yourself in some regard right but also, having heard her stand up for herself, you really have to question um, just how much of an understanding she has of the way her actions can lead to some some in unintended consequences. She seems incapable of grasping the idea that maybe, maybe she she might be the issue, right? She mentions the people she has problems with, she lists them off, and the fact that they've got a vendetta against her, and the fact that they're doing all these to fuck her over, and then change the narrative about her, but sometimes in life, I think, if you have so many people around you pointing a finger and saying really mean things about you, it might be, just might be because you're saying some fucked up shit. It just might be because you are um, purposely wrangling up people, or purposely winding people up, and I think the weird part of her of her yes jaws is that she doesn't seem to she doesn't seem to be she doesn't appear as a she doesn't come across as a very vindictive person she doesn't come across as a provocateur she doesn't strike me as somebody that's saying things to elicit a reaction it just seems like she's a bit ditzy and she says and does things um uh in sequence that would make you think what the fuck are you doing right why would you do that right um so and considering just how she's viewed in hip-hop and you know the kind of Un unsaid things that are going on with her in general with women and especially with black women especially with black dudes who are trying to holler at her probably didn't get a chance to holler at her whatever it may be going there's something really weird happening in the air when it surrounds her jaws and i can't really put my finger on it because when you look at her on paper she doesn't really do that much wrong really if you think about it right she's what from florida she's helped to put a few of the guys from that scene on she promoted parties all around the country she was, I don't know, integral part of Rolling Loud and getting people on that stage. She helped to manage 07 Shake for a while, introduced her to good music, um, got her radio thing going on, like clothing brand, um, collaboration, I think, with Puma. She seems to be like, you know, fairly, um, she, been, she seems to be f doing fairly well for herself without having to step on anyone's toes, without having to snake anyone or or on paper look as it appears as she's slipping her way to the top. And even if she was, I wouldn't really give a shit, it's not my business, but... She seems to be doing things pretty well, right? In a, in a quite the right way. So I think having watched the interview, it just seems to me that people don't like her and she unlikes people, right? And I think it's fairly okay for you not to like somebody and just for us to coexist in this world, this kind of little subculture that we call hip hop or this little community that we have called hip hop, right? I think it's fairly fine. It's okay. There's, there's no harm in that. You don't like her, she don't like you, no problem. But I think some of the weird um underlying tones that have been used about her in terms of race in terms of cultural appropriation in terms of being a culture vulture i think that's grossly grossly unfair and some of it um really misses the mark as to why these things are being said in the first place i, f I think i mentioned it a few times i think prior when it comes to um oh i think i mentioned it prior when it comes to i was thinking the other day right there's a few it happens a lot i don't know what just me thinking in my head i was thinking if i was a girl a regular looking girl like to say whatever from middle of nowhere right and i saw an influx of these kind of influ um health and fitness and um wellness influencers coming into that space who were ridiculously attractive ridiculously fit ridiculously had their life to, uh, who appeared to have their life together right it really rubbed me up the wrong way that they'd, they'd come up to me and tell me that mike it was okay to have curves that they would promote body positivity 
it just struck me a bit disingenuous. It just kind of left a sour taste in my mouth. And when I, the first person I think of when I think of something like that is a Jamila Jamil, right? Jamila Jamili or whatever her name is, right? The person that's always kind of going at the, uh, the Kardashians for promoting flat tummy tea. You look at someone like that who, you know, could easily um, be a model, who easily has, uh, you know, who's, you know, who, who, who could benefit from the uh, beautiful privilege. And for someone like her to kind of be, you know, talking about body positivity and embracing your curves and, you know, you, you're unique and you're beautiful the way you are. It just comes across a bit disingenuous, right? It just doesn't doesn't really, you know, sit right with me. Now, just thinking about it from a girl's point of view. And then it got me thinking in general about um, how hard it must be to work in an industry, um, being a female and also being ridiculously attractive and also being really good at what you do. There has to be an issue with that, right? That's be something that you have to kind of constantly combat, something that you can't really help, right? The fact what you look like and, you know, what, what is what it is. I think she mentioned in the interview herself, um, yes, Jules, that she does overly sexualize herself, but, you know, what, what can you do, right? She's a young girl. She thinks she looks hot in clothes or in no clothes sometimes. It's all well and good to do what you want to do. It shouldn't cheapen what you have to say, but sometimes in life we can't help but think that, right? It's a, it's the reason... The, there's a reason why when people go to court, they don't wear scruffy clothes, right? They want to put their best surf together, right? Um, sometimes you can't help, but you can't help. Sometimes there's nothing you can do about what people think about you based on what you wear or how you present yourself on the interwebs. But there is also an issue that no one wants to talk about of how hard it must be for people that are really attractive and really good at what they do, right? Especially when it, especially when you have a bit of a, you know, unappealing personality let's say with just jaws i wouldn't say she's unappealing i've never met the girl but i could get why people wouldn't like her i can understand why right how she might come across right that's all well and good but i think there is something about her way she looks that really that really is the main contributing factor to why people don't like her i think if she was ugly right i think she did she didn't look the way she did and she still said things that she said i don't think they would want to cancel as much as they want to cancel her now i think the fact that she says what she says the fact that she looks the way she does the fact that most dudes in that industry want to fuck her i think is what leads to this weird sort of battle that's happening right where um some of the women that are in hip-hop who kind of want to be cultural influencers who kind of want to be the movers and shakers the touch points of, of of culture are getting a bit annoyed when this like you know fair fair skinned i think she's latino right? i think she mentioned she was cuban or whatever she may be this um uh, on, on paper white girls kind of come in and, and kind of taking what they think is rightfully theirs and that really kind of like rubs me up the wrong way because i think in general for people to succeed people to take over the world we need allies in all different from all different races colors and creeds hip-hop should be an umbrella or an example to the world by and large a world that's been you know inundated with populism and nationalism and identity pop uh, identity politics i mean hip-hop should be a platform where we can all come around together and show the world look look how look look the amazing work that we can do under the umbrella of hip-hop look at all of us where we come from socioeconomic levels background race colors and creeds and look how united we are and look at how far we've gone forward in uplifting this entire scene right instead of kind of um sniping at each other and telling this person isn't black enough that person isn't that person's too white it's just like it's just where are we gonna go with this this isn't gonna get us anywhere we want to get to but with that being said, you know, people got to let the jokes fly. The thing that I thought that was the most funny about the whole interview was her kind of conversation about the Joe Budden issue, right? Why she thinks Joe Budden might have an issue with her. And I think I actually left some stamps on here because I don't want to listen to the whole thing. But here's one of the stories that she mentioned about Joe Budden, right? Because her and Joe Budden were apparently cool in the beginning. She was on one of the first podcasts that they did when it used to be called Our Name Is Podcast Later. And all of a sudden the kind of narrative changed and it kind of got a bit messy with her. But here's what she has to say. You didn't buy it, right? right? You didn't buy it? No, I didn't. Shout out to Joe Budden for lying on his podcast saying that I bought my ass because I didn't and he knows oh, that. Oh, talk to that nigga. Sorry talk we, to him. Fuck sorry, we never got to go to dinner, Joe. Um, I was a little busy when you were hitting me up, but... So oh, here we go. shit. shit. So, Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Oh, and by the way, Murder Mook is so corny. Like, I think he's one of Joe Budden's friends or, you know, industry friends or whatever it may be called, but he's so corny. Have you ever... We all have that guy in our group, right, that when girls are around... They do the most, they try to be the most jokey, the most fucking jovial. They're always trying to go back to, oh no, let her, let her speak, let her speak, let her speak, that kind of shit. Oh, you was licking her ass so much throughout the entire interview. It was so kind of nauseating. I think towards the end, he started, he realized what he was doing and tried to kind of compose himself and tried to be act cool, but it was too late. He was acting so cringe throughout the entire interview. And I think, again, this goes to show just where the kind of conflict will happen. Now, imagine if this was happening in a room full of just industry people or people from the scene and black girls around and they saw um, 
guys that they kind of respected hip hop artists you know um i don't know um drooling over yes jewels right hanging on her every word laughing overly overly laughing at every joke that she did i could I, I could understand where the resentment will come up from but it doesn't really come from anywhere real it's not, it's not something that she does it's not her fault that guys are acting out this way especially imagine murder mook is joe brother's friend and he's sitting there and kind of ho hooting and hollering and whole shit oh shit about something that she's saying you know quite disparagingly about one of his mates there's nothing that she can do to help it, but you can understand where it comes some of the festering ill will will come from. Let's carry on. Wait a minute! <laughs> Wait a minute! You no, said... I'm not, no, for real. Oh, no, I'm this, this is for real. This I, is, so here's the thing, I'm pissed off because here's what happened. Wait, when you said, Joe, you said dinner. You said Joe dinner. had me on his podcast. He asked me to come on his podcast. I came on the podcast. He was super cool. I fuck with Joe. He was super cool. His team was cool. His team was funny. I might need some liquor. After that, we ended up, um, yeah, I might need some today. After that, so after that, all of us, like me and my homies that came to the podcast, to his house for a podcast or whatever, mm -hmm. we all went to the city, got lunch, chilled, hung out. Um, and then... After that, uh, he would hit me up randomly just like to hang out or whatever. And I was just like never able to hang out. Then one night. Well, 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 Mr. Joe Budden. That is a bit sticky, isn't it? Because, you know. I'm in a movie and he calls me three times in a row, Joe Budden, randomly, right? In I was with a dude I was... I'm in a movie with a dude I'm, I'm seeing, and mm -hmm. Joe Budden pops up on my phone. How long ago was this? Three times. This was like a couple years ago. Okay. So... Mm -hmm. I, so I Murder Mook really, really helping out his friend here, isn't it? Murder Mook is really being a good friend here, isn't he? A real good friend. God damn it, man. I pick up just in the middle of the movie just so my dude knows, like, um, you know, it's nothing weird. So I'm like, yo, Joe, what's up? He's like, man, I'm at Kith right now, and they playing me. You need to tell your homie, like, they can't be treating me like this here. I'm like, yo, 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 calm down. What happened? He's like, nah, I'm about to give it to this cashier, man. You better tell, you better call Ronnie and tell him right now that he's got, that he's got somebody over here that's about to get beat. And I was like, what happened? He's like, they won't let me return these sweatpants. And it's such a Joe Budden thing to do, right? He's fucking arguing on the phone, hooting and hollering because of fucking sweatpants. 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 Okay? Sweatpants. So, listen, and it's nighttime. I'm in a movie. He called yeah. me three times about some $400 sweatpants. So, listen, so I call Ronnie. I was like, listen, Ronnie, you know I hate to bug you about this right now. And Ronnie is chill Jewish man. He hates... He hates drama. He's in bed by 9 o'clock. He's got his wife. He don't care about any of this clout mm -hmm. shit. So, I'm like, yo... Can you do me a favor, man, and just call the uh, the the store in uh, Soho and let them and tell them to let uh, Joe Budden return those sweatpants? It was open at that time, the store. The, in, <laughs> in Soho. Oh, okay, okay. So I was like, yeah, let him return the sweatpants. So Ron, Ronnie's like, man, are you serious? I'm like, yeah, please, just do it for me. So he's like, let me call you back. Boom, boom, boom. Movie's over. Ronnie calls me back. Jules, my store clerk just sent me a screenshot of a picture of Joe wearing the sweatpants outside his stoop or at his house. Christ. And I'm like, what? And he, I'm like, yo, send it to me. <laughs> he sends me the picture Joe's wearing. <laughs> This is the thing, like, because there's some, there's, it's, it's an American thing, though, right? It's an American thing of, like, standing and putting your outfits. Like, Joe Bunham's got loads of pictures where he stands there with his outfit and then it's a weird caption. You don't really see a lot of English dudes do that, right? It's, a, it's not a European thing. Mostly, a lot of European guys have the picture of them walking somewhere, like a press shot, like a lot of the, the sartorialist thing. But it's a really American thing to just stand somewhere with an outfit and just look at the camera, right? And just, like, have someone take a picture of you. Joe Bunham's got them all lit on his, on his fucking Instagram feed. And he's got maybe, maybe if not the worst dress sense I've ever seen in my life. Up there, maybe with a decent mirror like kind of style of wearing like where well, it's just like what the fuck are you wearing like just a fucking you know tornado of brands and colors um um you can so much so that he's got an actual parody account out at the moment on instagram called joe button fits that's fucking hilarious i recommend you check it out but it's a very um it's a very american thing though i don't really i don't really see a lot of english dudes do it just stand and take pictures apart from the influencers just regular dudes just stand and take pictures and be like you know and put like a quote on the flipping caption it's not really a thing that we do if anything like i said i've, I've seen a lot of the kind of like the sort of pictures where somebody's uh, on smoking on their phone walking somewhere they're trying to take like a candid tmz sort of like paparazzi kind of shot but the american thing of like just standing and taking pictures is so bizarre it never looks natural it always looks weird and you know, especially if you're Joe Budden and you dress like shit anyway, it looks even more bizarre. But hey, ho, what can you do? And again, that's kind of, that's kind of one on one, isn't it? It's one it's one on one of 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 um, wearing clothes that you might return somewhere in the future, right? Don't wear them in public and don't take pictures of them on. Same like if you're gonna call in sick to work, 
don't start posting Instagram stories, right, of yourself out in a bar somewhere or posting on Instagram. You go zero dark thirty on social media if you if you call in sick at work. That's the thing that we all knew, we all know what to do, right? We all know what to do in that regard. Even liking stuff on some profiles can be dangerous. <laughs> In the sweatpants so now he makes me look crazy because he wore the sweatpants and he was yeah i wore them in a picture i didn't like them and i'm trying to return them myself. jesus like, christ you know what i'm saying or he you just wore them and then just return them because you got them off the picture because so yeah so basically ever since then we didn't really like converse after that right mm -hmm. um and this is a problem with the joe budden right especially if you have yes jewels he doesn't have any shame I love Joe Budden. I love the Joe Budden podcast. I listen to it every single week, Wednesdays and Saturdays. And it's fairly obvious to see that this guy has no shame, which is part of the reason why he's so successful, right? He doesn't have any shame. Like, it's why he was, you know, for, I think, six or, six or seven tracks, he was ranting and hollering, barking at the moon when it came to Drake. And he didn't feel as if, like, he he looked crazy because he generally thought that Drake was sub, uh, sub, um, subbing him, whatever it may be called. They had a personal issue behind the scene. But to us and the outside public, we thought this guy looked fucking nuts. And we let him know this repeatedly. And he just didn't care. He just kept releasing six minutes, seven minutes, ten minute diss tracks again and again and again and again until he stopped so suddenly, right? He doesn't have any shame. So mentioning this story about him to mostly people, regular people like me and you, right, would be like, oh, so cringe, man, I embarrassed myself, I can't believe I did that, I can't believe I fucking embarrassed myself in public like that, but to Joe Biden, he has no shame, he'll probably go on a fucking 10 minute, 20 minute rant about this whole situation and break it down and make it look okay, but fucking hell, how embarrassing is this, like really, how embarrassing is this, like just, just embarrassing, just like, you know, why, just, you know, it's just, so pair of sweatpants. They don't want to return to you. Cool, man. Kick the fuzz, kick off, kick up, kick some display units and keep it moving. But I don't know, man. I don't know. I don't know. And I kind of thought he was a clown. So after that, <laughs> after that and then here comes another man. So then, oh, that's your friend, right? Imagine that's your friend. That's your friend. But again. I think I'll stop it there because it gets corny and Murder Mook keeps laughing and doing his thing. You can watch it yourself the whole interview. But essentially, what it comes down to is that the, the, some people don't like Yes Jules, Karen Civil, Scotty Beam. They don't like her, which is understandable why. Effectively, they probably don't like her because she's just black. It could be a reason why. It could be because, you know, where she looks, could be way too conscious as things. But also in the Yes Jules thing, I think if you're Yes Jules, you have to really get better at um, your the way you speak and the way you conduct yourself. I think... In general, there is a lack of decorum. There is a lack of articulation in the scene about really explaining yourself. And I think it really goes to... And the thing, if you think about it a lot with her kind of recent relationships, I think you can see why Yes, Jules and Kanye are friends, right? They both have a lack of communication. They both struggle to put words and sentences together or to really understand how their actions could be viewed one way or the other, right? She doesn't really understand how sometimes things can work in all... The way things happen in kind of... They play out in public can sometimes shape the way people think of you and the narrative that's going around it and you have a big part to play in it sometimes taking a step back and not saying things and keeping mum or calling people uh, behind the scenes and arranging meetings whatever it may be called can go a long way in order to kind of fix your image I, I think because she obviously cares what people think about it. even though she's talking about this sort of stuff and acting like she's not bothered and she's you know being a big girl she definitely cares about what people think and it's definitely great in her and getting at her that everyone is kind of saying these things about her and trying to festively counsel her because you know she has a whole team on her back she's trying to make an industry and the more that people you know the more of these sniping that she gets the people in the scene that are going to be you know heads into work with her so much so she mentioned before she lost her record deal basically on the back of some of the things that she would answer she was doing in public so i think if you're yes jules the only thing you can control is what you do in your actions right you can't control how people view you how to respond to you whatever it may be you can control your actions i think she has to really look in the mirror and really analyze and think to herself what am i doing to contribute to this level of hate and toxicity that's coming my way and venom is coming because it seems like it's very mean-spirited scotty bean wants to beat her up karen civil is calling her out on her bullshit joe budden is gonna probably um rant about her for 45 minutes on his podcast later on today they really really don't like her there has to be a reason why this is happening think about it clearly and maybe change course but i think in general as a, as a community it's okay if you don't like somebody it's okay you can just not like somebody and kind of go and carry on with your everyday life you don't have to get along with everybody that's around like it's still well and good she can do her thing um with the soundcloud rappers and, and continue putting them on and making sure everyone's getting opportunity that way and promoting her kind of all girl kind of conglomerate company she's got with the never not working thing and the radio stuff she continued doing her thing in her own um, universe without having to infiltrate or having to step 
step on anyone's toes on the other kind of quote unquote mainstream end that we can all work together but we should be working together in order to kind of propel and lift up this whole hip hop umbrella community that we will live under because I think that's the best way that we're going to succeed this sniping and you know and aiming at everybody and calling people out on their race and saying they're culture appropriate when they're really doing more good than bad is neither here or there I think for the most part and she's generally not a culture bro I don't think so I don't necessarily think she's doing anything that bad for the most part she doesn't get on with the certain personalities in the scene but that's okay for the most part she's putting artists on she's got a company she employs people what's the problem here let's just all try and get on and get on but i think if you're a job button like don't return fucking 400 dollars sweatpants and then blow people's phones up in order to return them that's fucking horrible that's cringe as fuck but again what do i know anyway that's 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 that for that let's move on because i wasted too much of my life um figuring out what um, the issue is going on over there blah 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 what else is on the list here um oh let's just get into some streetwear news right because there's some loads of stuff that's come out that i thought was of interest that i saw um on hype beast that i've saved here on the tabs number one right i've never been a big reebok guy i think most people that listen to this podcast or have heard me speak before in real life would know that i've got a bit of a love hate relationship with reebok mainly because i'm from east london i'm from the quote-unquote ends i've hang i've hung around with people that generally wear reeboks you know when reeboks didn't used to be cool and used to be associated with national front and the bmp right i know where that image comes from and it kind of has a sleep style taste in my mouth but then the older you get you change scenes and things to get you know appropriate in different areas and now hipsters wear them and you know quote whatever with their black trousers and their white socks and their white dirty shoes it's, it's become like the athletic version of a converse right and it still kind of lets this out taste in my mouth. But these Reeboks from Packer, right? These Packer Grayscale Reebok um, Asterix look fucking incredible, right? They remind me of maybe some New Balance 990s, maybe. That's why I probably like them. But these look fucking incredible. So much so that I'd maybe consider getting a pair of Reeboks. I said I've never wear Reebok. I'd say it's kind of go against everything I stand for to wear a pair of Reeboks. Because if I wear a pair of Reeboks, just remind me of some fucking palace wanker wearing tracksuits and skateboarding down the street with a sovereign ring on. It kind of just annoys me to the fuck off, right? But there's something about these shoes that look fucking awesome. Maybe it's the fact that they look like New Balances. Maybe it's the color it's the color blocking on them maybe it's the photography maybe it's the fact that they've got this little insert on the picture on them that makes the toe kind of flatten out a little bit but regardless i think these are easily one of my favorite um releases that have come out recently um so you've got mostly an all great maybe it does remind me of a 990 right because it has in the front panel it does have the kind of similar sort of thing that you'd see in a 990 here the little front little suede bit here in the front but they look fucking awesome, man. Like, really, 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 really good. Um, they are coming out um, on Friday, the 15th. They're priced at $115 um, and they're available on Packer Shoes. I really recommend you check them out. Um, it's an Aztec re Aztec reissue, right? It says, yeah, since the Aztec was well tuned reissue last year, the style has been sought after for its chunky silhouette and pays homage to the quintessential 90s style. But yeah, really amazing shoe. Probably one of my favorites has come out recently. I recommend you check it out. Again, this is what being a sneakhead's about, right? Getting models that aren't necessarily the most popular, the most hypest thing, right? Doing away with Air Max 1s and Air Jordan 1s and Air Max 90s and 95s and Adidas Superstars. All the bait shit, do them, put them to one side. Being an actual sneakhead is buying trainers like these and fucking, you know, sourcing them up as they saying, you know what I mean? Incorporating them into your drip, right? Making them look sick, right? That's where that's what being a sneakhead is in my uh, in my humble opinion. I recommend you check these out. Um, they're the Packer uh, Grayscale Aztecs from Reebok. They're available on Friday from PackerShoes.com, right? That's one. Let's hide that screen. Let's come back here. Let's go to the next one. What else have I said on tabs that I wanted to talk about here? Ooh, yeah, Oakley and Vetterman glasses, right? These are fucking awesome. Um, I think these debuted. Uh, I'm gonna see, yeah, Spring Summer 19, right? The one where I think this is this is a collaboration where um this is for the collection where the models were working on the table. And I think this is Demna's kind of homage to his Georgian roots and, you know, kind of talk, spoke about the entire history of Georgia. A really kind of emotional collection of raw and think it was outside of the models walking on the table. But these glasses look fucking incredible. So they're effectively just, you know, the ochres that you'd see um, um, somebody wearing in America where they're calling the police on some... Uh, 
um, black person because they're barbecuing or because they're playing music out in public. But then they've kind of spriced them up with fucking studs and really accentuated some of the colors with, you know, bright pops of neon and other kind of colors on them, translucent lenses. And they look fucking awesome. They look really fucking cool. I think I saw an image recently I, on um, matches.com that they're supposed to be sold out of all of them. And I think they were $800 or something along the kind of lines, which is, you know, a lot cheaper than I would have expected them to be. I would expect to be maybe a bit more expensive than that. But for eight hundred dollars and for considering what they look like, they look fucking incredible. I really, really like them. Um, again, Oakleys are really it's not something you see a lot of people wearing nowadays at all. Um, maybe it's because of Supreme, because there was a period. Remember, Supreme kept doing collaboration with Oakleys all the time, and then now they started to do their own in-house sort of um, glasses collaboration, which they tend to quite often, right? I remember reading an interview with um, James Jebbia talking about his collaboration with Supreme collaboration with North Face. The reason why they do it with North Face because they're not able to manufacture that level of a product, right? That high level of product. So they would rather partner up with somebody and make something really good and then do their own thing and make it subpar. So it seemed like in the beginning when they were collaborating with Oakley that they weren't necessarily at the level of operation or production where they could, you know, produce a high level glasses. But now since they've kind of, you know, iterated, iterated, iterated and become more successful over time, they've suddenly become able to do that kind of level of collaboration. So that's why you probably don't see the Oakley collaborations with them so much. And that might be and the reason why overall Oakley glasses aren't as popular as they would be back in the day because you know they're not as many collaborations going around because you know remember those collaborations with every sort of street brand happening at the time Supreme was doing it same as what was happening with Casio right when Casio watches was everywhere now you don't really see Casio's collaborations as much as you did in the past so not in regular person street isn't really wearing a Casio that much but I think these glasses from Oakley um, and Vetterman look fucking amazing and again a good compliment to what um, Demna was doing at Balenciaga with the new glasses that I think debuted recently that launched a little cap collection i think in the street market but again um if i had the funds and if it was something that would be available there's something that hamberson wear in a fucking heartbeat really really nice and again maybe a, a good little um a good little compromise with them would maybe be the Heron Preston Nike glasses that he did recently. They might be a good option to do as well. Um, but again, these all look fucking awesome and play into the whole 90s revival that we're seeing happening in the late um, recently now in the last couple of years and in the last few years, actually, in fashion overall. But yeah, I recommend checking them out. Um, Vetamar and Oakley collaborations from spring, summer 19. Um, we hide that one. Then we go to the next time. Oh, okay, so um, this is an interesting collaboration or interesting little project. Uh, Nike have decided to... I think I read an article recently. I'm going to maybe go on the next tab, but supposedly Air Max Day has been cancelled or they're changing the way they do Air Max Day and kind of promoting Air Maxes, um, certain Air Max models within a certain city and then kind of, you know, ha in order to kind of harness or foster community. Just more bullshit, wanky... Oh, there's a crane here somewhere doing something. Um, just more bullshit, wanky marketing speak from Nike. You know, they're trying to re, you know, rejig the thing. MX Day, MX Day is gay. Always has been. Always shit. It doesn't make any sense. They just regurgitating retro models and trying to, you know, sell them to sneakerheads as limited edition to get them to queue up so they can use it as marketing material and justify their of inflated wages. Whatever it is, right? But um, this little shoe that I've seen them do, um, a little homage to Berlin, is incredibly weird and w interesting, and I don't really know what what the point of it is. I saw something mentioned the other day that supposedly this is a collaboration with Honey Dijon, the DJ, but I don't. Again, it doesn't make any sense to me. In the press, I think in the it, again, I don't really r read what hype beats write in the articles because it's usually it's not anything of any sort of note um, or merit for that mark. But let's see what they've written about this collaboration here. Um, Nike takes what's it here? Nike takes a historic trip to Germany with a Nike Air Max 180 B or N, right? Um, featuring neon spades, shades of green, pink underneath a grey mesh. The fusion was created as a ode to the Japanese of Berlin, celebrated color by and brutalist architecture, which again I don't understand. With an actual combination of black, neon green, transparent white, the words unity and freedom are plastered all in caps to remind the club's musical power. Begin the now they're gonna drop um mx day 26th of april of march in berlin retailers first followed by a wider release so i guess what they're going to do over overall they're gonna again it's just you know just if you're going to do this whole like community fostering thing just release them only in berlin they're going to release them first in berlin release them later afterwards why just do just have just have certain collections launch in their location that they're meant to launch in and then that's it and then that way you can actually foster real organic um desirability people are actually going to want to buy these shoes they're going to want to fly over to berlin they're going to want to maybe uh, proxy a shoe and get it shipped over that's what's going to happen <gasps> again i don't know whatever and again 
why they went with Emma? If you go to Berlin, right, the first thing you notice is that people that go to clubs or that hang around don't really wear bright colored trainers. It's not really a thing because most of the people that go to these nightclubs or these warehouse spaces, they're fucking dirty as fuck, right? They're grimy. They're amazing places, but they're grimy as fuck. Just even to get there, they're not the most, you know, cleanest of streets, right? The spaces are really dirty and grimy. People are spilling drinks and beer and piss all over the place. So the, the idea that you'd go into a nightclub wearing white Air Force Ones is a bit weird, right? So that's the same reason why you wouldn't necessarily wear um, suede upper Air Max 180s with mesh on them, right? They're going to attract dirt like a fucking vacuum. It doesn't make, or suck up there like fucking vacuum. It doesn't make any sense, right? Why you'd have a colorway of a Berlin shoe encapsulate that. That doesn't really work well. And the great, the best example I saw of a Berlin kind of inspired shoe was the Adidas that they did recently, where they took the colors from the um, the subway, um, from the upholstery on the subway and kind of adopted those on the color of the, of the Adidas shoe. I forgot what it was. It might have been a ZX or something on the lines. That worked in some regard. But this is like, huh? Why a 180? Why this color? It doesn't make any sense. Unity. Do you, you don't need to say unity in Berlin. That That's like part of their DNA, right? It's not even something they even preach about exclusivity. Like, that's the reason why you, Berlin is such one of the amazing cities in the world because pe- everyone is able to go there and be exactly who they want to be in a free, um, safe space. And it's just like, why a 180? Why that colorway? Um, why on Air Max 1, Air Max Day? And again, if you go to Berlin... You don't really see many people wearing Air Maxes either. Outside of sneakerheads, right? It's just not really a thing that you see general people wearing. And it's just, again, just like, you know, just ineptitude of these companies sometimes when it comes to release of these trainers. You're like, what does this even mean? Like, I'd, I'd, I'd hate to think what they're going to do with their um, London shoe. I'd hate to think. Is it going to be an Air Max 1 or some bullshit? And they're going to do it in the colours of the fucking uh, London sky and the greyness, the brutalist. I was like, come on. Anyway. Enough about it said the better. It's going to come out on the 20th of March. For those of you guys that buy every single Air Max regardless of the colorway, you're going to buy it anyway, but I was skipping that one. Um, next on the list here, oh, actually, no, I don't want to speak about um, uh, Keith Flint, but the cause of death of Keith Flint has been confirmed, but, you know, that's too much hardness, too sad to kind of talk about. Um, next on the, on the docket here, we've got um, Jerry Lorenzo debuted in a new, a new colorway of, the, um, of his Fear of God 1 uh, for Nike. Um, I like what Jerry Lorenzo is doing, right? I think it's a general thing most people do anyway in general um, or most kind of style influencers where most of the colorways are being announced or being revealed when he's in motion, when he's um, in and around town going to senior events. And this is a great little tie-in. I think they were promoting the Nike women's or the US, the Nike, is it the US women's um, kits or whatever they may be called, the thing in Paris, whatever, launch. And during that thing, obviously, um, Nike flew out of um, uh, Jerry Lorenzo being one of their main collaborators. And he obviously went there and debuted a new colorway of the shoe. Um, again, something that I, I really like the shoe, man. I'm really a big fan of it. I think he really smashed it and did a really good job. It might not be something that I generally would wear day to day, but I think the way he's married them up with these uh, sweatpants, I'm assuming is are uh, things that are part of his kind of overall collection, which I'm definitely sure they are. Um, and then he's got the Visvim Kerchief um, jacket, which is, you know, one of my favorite pieces from Visvim out there. It's fucking grossly, grossly overpriced, but, you know, that that's what Visvim do. But it also, it's nice as well that he actually wears for stuff from other brands, right? He's just not always wearing his stuff head to toe. He loves a bit of visdom here and there. Um, but these shoes look fucking awesome. I like the colorway. So it's like an all gray upper with like an off white or sale midsole. And the cage that wraps around this outside of the shoe is black. Um, again, it kind of gives it a more of an athletic 90s kind of off court feel. And again, just looks a fucking like a cool shoe. It's just like a really Jerry Lorenzo shoe. If he could make a perfect um, Nike for himself, this definitely would be the one. Um, again, um, no confirmation on the date of when it's going to be released. I like the little hit there with the white suits on the side. It's just a perfect little shoe that he made, isn't it? Um, no confirmation so far on what date it's going to be released, but just a little um, sneak peek of him walking towards the event. Um, the other day in Paris, and he looked fucking awesome. I'm a really big fan of what he did there with that shoot. Um, next on the list here, let's get this off the screen. Ba 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 ba. Ooh, my one of my favorite shoes ever. Right, one of the things I kind of regret um selling um uh my um com- uh defining moments pack um Jordans where it came. You know, you remember that Jordan pack that came back in the day where. One Jordan would be one number, the other would be the other, and they're both equal 23. I regret selling my Jordan 4, but this is easily one of my favorite shoes of all time. Probably one of the shoes that kind of got me started into being a sneakerhead in general. This and maybe the Air Trainer 1, right? The Cross Trainer, and this kind of looked like a development of the Cross Trainer. Again, one of Tinker Hatfield's 
best sneaker designs of all time. The Jordan 4, one of easy my best design colorways ever in my life. And the bread is out there with one of the best colorways out. I don't care what anyone says. So much so that, you know, every iteration of sneaker from even the stuff like this actually from even the um, the triple s has taken inspiration from a bread right that colorway overall has come from the jordan colorway right that's that, that's how influential that sneaker was overall so i'm a big fan of the bread colorway of the jordan 4 um and it's coming back again now again i'm not somebody that's a big fan of jordan retro i think they they have over the years fleeced and oh uh, and kind of you know oversaturated the market when it comes to jordans i think there was a period in time where jordan brand were in his were in intent on sending out subpar after subpar material product retros and jordan fuses were still hoover them up and then over time it kind of shifted and now jordan fans are kind of slowly but surely not wanting to buy some of the retros which is why jordan brand flood the market with crap after crap of sneakers out there they don't really sell that well um but i think they're con they're kind of you know they're understanding or acknowledgement of the kind of fuck-ups they've done in the past and then trying to rewrite the wrongs in terms of this model coming out now is good it's going the right way um it may be a higher quality of the over finished product and of naturally the the most important thing i think for most uh, jordan retro brand enthusiasts is the fact that they're reintroducing um the nike air logo on the back of the heel tab which is something that you know a lot of us have kind of been feeling over especially so much so that people go out go and buy um retros or no sorry they go and buy ogs or vintage pairs of jordan ones or jordan fours jordan threes and then kind of glue on the kind of newer soles in order to make sure they can wear them just so they have the nike air on the back for me the most important thing of the retro is the toe box this front bit here usually when they make them especially the last that they're using nowadays i've heard loads of conflicting stupid reports that they got rid of the old last and they can't retool them again but you know nike make a billion dollars every year probably off of air forces alone they can they can afford to make you to make a new uh tooling or new uh masters or whatever shapes they use to make of the jordan so that you can have that more of a flat silhouette because usually when they make them they always have that weird banana toe at the front and it looks really bizarre if you get them even if so, so so much so that i have to always buy my jordans a size below once like half size down just so i can get that flat toe but then obviously that quite that then results in my knuckles scrunching up at the front i really hope that they kind of figure it out and sort it out in the end um these shoes from the look from the looks of it look like they figured it out um again i can't tell because i'm not sure if they stuffed the toe box um but they look okay from here I'm not sure if these images are actually from Nike. I don't think they are from Nike because, you know, the laces are fucked up. They didn't even do the laces again. That's something you always look at when you're looking at sneakers. Like, come on, relace, relace the shoe, man. Um, sell it to us properly, but I don't care. It's got Nike on the back of it. I'm going to buy it. That is, that's that's basically the end of the matter, isn't it? Um, they're going to come out on May 11th. I select retailers, $200 each. Um, again, for me it's like a no-brainer i feel over some sneakers are gonna be like oh again with these fucking retros i know some of you guys are bored of it but i've always been a big fan of jordan 4 retros especially um the bread colorway with nike on the back of it and you know good quality materials a flat out a flat kind of like toe box that is kind of in profile or in kind of parallel with the ground and not bending up like a banana i'm gonna instantly buy so again check those out if that's something you're wearing kind of thing coming out may 11th May 11th for the Jordan 4 breads. Um, next on the docket here, let's quickly move on. Time is the, the essence. Nope, we don't want to talk about that. Oh, carry more spring summer 19 Japan, right? It's fucking weird, right? So I saw this little, I saw this featured in Hype Beast and it just caught me adrift. I didn't know this was a thing. But if you're a runner or if you're someone that is involved in the fitness space and you go and buy fitness equipment, you'll know if you go to Sports Direct, one of the brands that they have there that's always on sale that you can always buy loads of kind of running gear from is Carimo, right? And it's usually just bullshit stuff like leggings and tops and stuff. It doesn't really last that long. Um, I watched them a few times and it fucking, it goes out of shape. You get holes in your fucking tight sooner or later. But it appears as if Carimo is actually, you know, a legit brand that might have its own little purple label. Uh, I mean, um, look face purple label edition in japan so much so that they've got this full collection that's been featured on hypebeast which is fucking bizarre honestly it's like seeing um salinger um have a japan edition featured on hypebeast it doesn't make any sort of sense but again i guess you know in japan it's maybe looked at as a high bar brand but i know here for sure if you want to get like a cheap running bag or cheap running trainers this is where you get them from when you're at um what you would call it when you go to uh sports direct here in the uk um, but so far, it looks fucking awesome. Just like your regular Japanese uh, streetwear sort of look. Loads of great little jackets like this here on the right. It looks fucking incredible, right? Really fucking good stuff, man. It's better than most of the stuff you see in most streetwear brands out at the moment. And again, this is just carry more regular stuff. Look at the backpack even. 
that was a, like really good, like really fucking good stuff. Um, again, I'm not sure why this is. I'm not sure if this has always been a thing. Um, they've had their own little Japan edition, but this was fucking cool. Really, really cool. Um, Karen Moore Japan edition. Check it out. I see it available now. And, oh, look at those trousers. Panel trousers, mustard on the front with a little navy detail on the back. That looks incredibly cool. I love that. That styling detail with the orange sandals as well. Wow. Again, I'm not sure if this has always been a thing, but this looks fucking awesome. I love everything about this. So, I rec again, I recommend you check it out. Um, Karen Moore Japan edition. I'm not sure why this is. I'm not sure if it's something I've missed over time. Um... Again, I'm not going to read the uh, the press release there because usually they don't be probably any sort of new information. But if you guys know of any reason why this is, exists and why we get the shitty stuff in Sports Direct here in the UK, let me know um, because this looks fucking cool. Again, it'd be hard to get hold of to proxy all this stuff from the from Japan. This, this is probably my favorite jacket here. Oh, load up again. Shit. These slideshows are oh, so annoying on Happy Sunday. Um, I'm trying to get this up again. Where is it? Yeah, this jacket here is my favorite, I think, overall. This like grey jacket with the massive po pocket detail. Look, look at that look. That is that's quintessential Japan, isn't it? Right? Um Quintessential Japan, like a camper cat, a nice over a nice kind of rain jacket, a side pouch, some short socks, and some ACG ish type trainers. Again, brilliant, brilliant collection. I recommend you check it out. It looks really fucking cool. Um carry more. Japan Spring Summer 19. Anyways, that might be it, you know, because I need to head off. Um, yeah, that might be it. Um, episode number 169 of the Action Zinger Show. Thanks so much for tuning in. It's been a pleasure to have the company of you for this little episode today. As always, for information regarding me, check my website, actionalzinger.com. Um, not DJing this weekend in public. I'm only using this art gallery thing that I'm not allowed to invite anyone to, which is, you know, more than okay. Um, but apart from that, I'll probably see you guys again next week on the DJ circuit. But um, podcast wise, back again tomorrow. Information regarding me, check out my website, actionalzinger.com. Um, use my um, Audible uh, referral code at audible.com for us Aggie, audible.com for us A W G G Y to get one free book credit and a 30 day free trial. Check it out, check it in, check it out. And I'll see you guys again tomorrow for another episode of the show. Peace.